Okay. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. 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 Nice. So, uh, thank you for frying my brain. My brain was already fried. Um, <laughs> but uh, this is just a story, so no information. Um, should be quite lighthearted. So I'm Eric. So today this is a story about how I almost write an ORM. But I submitted this talk title like three months ago, and as I was preparing for this talk, I kind of evolved the talk to more like how I almost write a web framework. So let's just get started. So the story starts around August uh, 2014 when I first joined 99. Um, the existing system is built on top of Python and Mongo, and it's powered by Flask, the micro framework, and also Mongo Engine. So for people who don't know, um, Mongo Engine is an ORM. It provides a decorative approach to you know, do model validation. It also denormalizes normalized objects uh, and also provide an interface for writing and reading from database. All in all, it's really a very good um, ORM. So fast forward a bit to about March 2015, where you know that time it was the microservice craze. We decided to jump on that train, uh, write it, and we decided to write the whole entire backend into microservice. So as you all know, uh, microservice is a lot of I/O uh, operations rather than like computation. So we decided that okay, we need to move away from Flask. Um, so we switched to Tornado. That time Python 3.6, the async I/O stuff is new, not around. So we can't move to Tornado. And to keep it consistent, I mean, so it's easier to maintain. Um, all our repo, even those that don't need async, we also write everything in async. So as a junior that time, um, I was very excited. I get to build new stuff, try new things from scratch, right? No more legacy code. So I was tasked to build the listing service. So it's like the core database. And I was very spoiled by Mongo at the time, uh, Mongo Engine at the time. So I, I decided, okay, I need to find something similar. So what is listing service? Uh, it's a service that does contain one model file or one model, which is listings. Uh, it needs to validate the data integrity within the object only, so it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to do with normalization and denormalization. Uh, and because of me being familiar with Mongo at the time, I kind of decided, okay, I'm just going to use MongoDB. But wait, uh, Mongo engine is synchronous. I need something async. So as I learned from people, you don't build all the stuff if you don't need to. So I started looking uh, some, for something that works with Mongo and Tornado. So I found this guy, or uh, this fork of Mongo engine called Moto. Okay, but it's not stable. The builds are failing. Um, pull requests are not much in. And you know, issues that are not closed are not replied to. And all I want, I don't really like using it because it doesn't have a lot of the feature that I need. And I checked yesterday, I saw this, I'm like, okay, even to this day, not to shame, not to shame them, but it's really still feeling their builds. And you look at their last commit, it's like one year ago. So really not in active development, even to this day. So can I fork it? So I thought about it at that time, maybe I can just fork it, right? Like contribute back to the community. But I really think hard. Um, I only have a single model. Do I really need a full-fledged ORM? Probably not, right? And if it's a single model, there's no, no R, if you know what R stands for in ORM. So why not I just do manual check, right? Easy, write a function to check every single few in my models. Great ideas, right? No, not really. Don't take a genius to realize that like, you are going to write 30 over functions to validate one document. And most of them are probably repeated code. Really no point. So I thought about it. Perhaps I don't really need a full-fledged ORM. Well, MongoDB is very dictionary-based, right? Not not very hard to use, and I just need a way to decorative, decoratively, a decorative way to you know check your models. So I set up. I say, hey, because I can, let's build it. So MVP. This stands for minimum viable product not most valuable. What's that? <laughs> so, yes, uh, so MVP. One, decorative. 
Then you declare models and then you check out dictionary before you put into a database. And I want to use Moto, which is the Mongo, the raw um, wrapper for Mongo in Tornado. So version 1.0 came out one week later. Uh, it looks like this. Very ugly to me. Uh, anybody find this clean? I don't. It's so if you, I didn't explain the code of the code. So the few function is just a function that takes in, you know, key up, keyword up, and return a dictionary. I, I really don't like how this look and doesn't look like ORM. And okay, so the listing attribute is like in a, in a dictionary within, within a listing dictionary. So I look at this code and I say, well, um, it looks like I'm going to use this code a lot in the next one year to two years. I don't want it to look like this, right? So let's do it right. So I don't really know how to do it. So I started looking at other inspiration. I read, I went into Mongo engine, Moto engine, and to a certain extent, SQL Alchemy. I read their source code. And I found that, I, and I found their documentation and their source code to be able to do something like this. Which is way, way, way cleaner. Then I found well, how they do it. Uh, it's called Python Meta Classes. If you mm -hmm. want to know more about it, you can talk to me after this. But it's really, really interesting. It allows you to do sort of a meta programming thing. So after reading the source code for about a week and trying out various stuff, version 1.1, let's get it done. Looks something like this. <coughs> Cleaner. So as you can see, there's an update function at the bottom. So this is how you usually use it. You define models. It's just called clean function. It's going to clean. So clean does like setting of default values, uh, running checks, um, and stuff. And then the get errors will return you a list of errors that you have in your documents. And then if there is, you just return. If not, you just write to the database. Clean, right? Very useful for um, just one model files. So how it goes after that? Oh wait, before that. If you compare this, it really looks cleaner. Who disagree? No one, right? I assume. So how it goes? Uh, after one year, it kind of works. Uh, I ported it and I use it in multiple services where I need to check data before I put in mostly single model services. And along the way, I added a lot of improvement to that piece of code. So around, so fast forward to about uh, May 2016. Get this right. So that's where my first multi-model service comes around. You know, the R needs to be set up sooner or later. Um, so this is our subscription service. It's like a service that deals with payment, uh, our company products, what we are selling, and tracking the payment, subscription, transaction, promotion, and stuff like that. And I want, one thing about this service was I expected it to be rewritten within a year. Because at that time, um, we need, within a year, we need to do with renewal. Within a year, we need to have new product that we are selling. So I don't really want to overkill on something that will probably be, needs to be rewritten. So I look at it and say, okay, this method that I have, because I, I'm going to copy, I, I'm going to rewrite this whole thing and I don't really know what I want. I'm just going to copy this for all eight models that I have. Anybody think it's a great idea? Definitely not. But I made a conscious decision. Because I know at that time, I don't know what I want. I don't know what I need to abstract out. So sometimes I would say, if you don't know what you want, copy is fine. <laughs> you all can disagree with me, but you all will listen to the end of the story. <laughs> so not yet. So fast forward about a year later to April 2017, where my second um, kind of multi-model service came around. So this time it was up for Indo Indonesia portal site. So in this uh, project, we kind of took it side differently. Uh, we didn't want one model for every, one, one service for every model. We realized that we want to share all the code and put all the data service in one place. So that's, that's one of the requirements. So because of that, I know within the next one year, the number of models is going to grow by like 10, five to 10. Then copying really, really don't make sense now because I know what's going to happen. And also this time around, I'm using SQL due to the legacy reason. And I don't really want to write manual SQL statements. So what I did, simple, take the model files. 
I generate SQL statement based on the model files, and I generate the data fun database function based on the model as well. So example, this is like how a create statement is being generated. You can one minute for you to digest. You can see. Actually, I can open. I open source the code. I'll show you later. So, fast forward slightly to June this year. As expected, this guy needs to be rewritten. Um, same thing. A lot of new business requirement. New things they are selling. I mean, as a company, you make money, right? But this time round, I also decided that I want to keep it as MongoDB to reduce the amount of database migration I do. So same problem I face. I don't want to be generating my Mongo statements. Everything generated based on models. Same thing, database function generated. And also lastly, I will even generate even more utility function based on models, like aggregation calls and stuff like that. So Python allows you to do partial functions. This is something that got me, got, I mean, there's like eight functions as a two of them. So it looks something like this in the code. So what's next for this? I thought very hard after writing the subscription service. I was like, wow, I could do so much more with this. Um, I tried a prototype of decorative approach to defining request handlers. Um, it was for one of our scraper service. I shouldn't say that now here, but um, it, it allows us to query a, pre, a database, right? So I just need to define it uh, what I want. But I could take it further and say, just define models and perhaps generate the that generator, uh, request handler. Front end forms, anyone? This can be done, right? Not hard. CMS, and maybe a full fledged Django Rails, I don't know. Uh, I got really close to thinking about doing this. Then I realized. Um, my obsession with abstraction goes way, 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 way back. Um, it's like 2006 when I graduated from Poly. Um, that time was Java. Uh, I wanted to write a code generator for J2E. Uh, I don't know why. I just realized that writing CRUD code is really, really tedious. So perhaps maybe I can just define XML file in and I have application out, right? And that can be a freelance. I don't even need to work. But the further I got I was actually to just generate SQL queries. Um, really because um, one, I was going to NS. Even during NS, I was doing this. Uh, but there was no motivation, right? This gets to more of a learning point that I have. Um, that you need to first um, find or experience the problem in the first place before you actually want to write a tool for it. If you just write for sale writing, you usually can't finish the project. So as I said, short talk, uh, summary. So an advice for people who are solving problems, I would say. So step one, find an existing solution. If you need new things, extend it if you need, if you can. Um, you are probably not the first one to face that problem. That's for sure. But sometimes existing solution is either too bloated or too lacking in feature. So if you want to build yourself, step one, identify your scope. Identify what you actually need. Limit them, don't try to build everything one shot. Um, that way you at least get your MVP out. And then uh, take inspiration and study the existing solution. So for example, uh, in my case, I learned meta classes from reading the Mongo engine and the Moto engine source code. And that got me to where, I, where the project was. And lastly, iterate. Even if you are so ambitious, like what, what I was thinking, building request handler and stuff like that. If you don't need it, don't build it. It's really no point. You don't really want, you know what you want. And two takeaways that I have. Uh, one third was, in order for you to build libraries or tools, you kind of have to experience the problem in the first place. If not, it's, you can't finish it. But also, in order for you to understand the purpose of the library and abstraction, you need to first experience the pain of not having it. Right? So for example, copying and pasting code helps me to learn that, okay, what is the actual pain point that I have and what can I do to solve that? So that's all I have. Thank you. And question. Oh, and uh, that's the link to the open source checker if you want to use. Can contribute if you want. Any question? Excuse me. Your application uses one database or multiple databases? 
uh, you mean my services? Yeah, just so, one MongoDB instance? Or? So every service has their own MongoDB instances. But they all have to be MongoDB? Mm, we have a mix of SQL, Postgres, and MongoDB. It's just, we, we made a choice to say, okay, it's up to the developer to use what they're suitable of. That's the idea of microservice, I guess. Right. But so, whoever, based on the developer, if the developer is um, more familiar with Mongo, then we then you use, let them use Mongo. Uh, although we are now trying to standardize everything as well. Did you consider having each microservices write directly to the database instead of doing an abstraction? Mm, they are writing directly through the uh, database actually. So no, it, the, uh, there are some services that I have that doesn't have um, this model house. So those are more, uh, I would say, caches that don't have to do the account check checking. All it does is just fetch data and cache them somewhere. So those don't rely on this model house. But the model house is more for data services where you need to validate your data and inputs. While you're using that sort of carried away of abstraction, I think that's all the answer on your side there. Um, did you give serious thought to expressing what amounts to form validation code in a way that could be used both in the front end and the back end? So if you look at the code, um, so the way I wrote this is also based on the concept of mixing. So um, let me get to, let me see. So, all you do, all you're doing at the top two part is the part where you define models, right? In theory, um, it just describes how the model looks like. So what you do with that description uh, or that part of the code doesn't it's not tied to backend models or front end. Right. Sorry, I was asking more concrete. Did you actually implement? No, not yet. Uh, to the front end generation or the. Um, in front of this is a, a user interface. Yep. Presumably, the user interface is also performing exactly the same validation on exactly the same rules. Mm, so, not really, because um, this is all more of a service at the lowest form. So, our uh, API uh, backend and the front end does their own validation. So, With across different, all different rules. Or different rules? Diff slightly different rules. So, for example, in our system where listing needs to be created, we have user. So the backend will have to check whether that user exists and stuff like that. So this is only pertaining to that one service, one data service. But we could in theory do this um, for form validation as well actually. Any more questions? We're 12 minutes early. Uh, so any more questions for Eric? Okay, so in that case, uh, thank you, Eric. Thank you.